Huge thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. This is what Albert Einstein's office looked like on the day he died. There's a rather interesting story to how this picture was taken, and I've been working with my friend and fellow YouTuber Chris Patterson on figuring out exactly what he was working on on his blackboard. In this video, we'll talk about some of the concepts of general relativity that we think are being used here. In a video over on Chris's channel, we've looked at the story of this particular picture, including how the photographer had to bribe a security guard to get into the office in the first place. So please make sure to check out the video on his channel as well. Let's get into it. Let's begin by taking a look at this quantity here on the blackboard. It crops up a few different times and is known as the metric tensor, or more simply, just the metric. In this particular case, it's represented by the Greek letter eta, but eta is used to represent a very specific metric tensor. Generally, the metric is represented by the letter g. The metric essentially encodes what kind of space-time we are working with in any given scenario. The metric looks different, if we're working with flat space-time, or if it's curved in some specific way, the metric tensor will look different, or if it's curved in some other specific way, the metric tensor will look different again. So the metric allows us to determine how distances, angles, and time work in the space-time that we're theoretically working with. Because remember, the whole point of the space-times we work with is that they determine how objects embedded within those space-times will behave and interact with each other. For example, light, if found in a space-time curve like this, will have to move along a line like this, known as a geodesic. It cannot physically follow what we would call a straight line, because it would have to leave the space-time that it's in, maybe through a wormhole, in order to do this. As for now, we don't know whether this is actually possible, so instead it's stuck to following these lines in our theories. And so, in this space-time, the most reasonable explanation of distance between two points is not necessarily the straight line or flat space-time distance between them. Rather, it's this distance. So that's a very basic explanation of the metric tensor. The i and k subscripts just tell us that this is a rank 2 tensor, meaning that in order to describe it fully, we need a certain minimum amount of information. The simplest way to imagine this is that a rank 2 tensor can be described by a matrix with rows and columns. A rank 1 would need just one of these, either rows or columns, where the value of i would represent which component we're talking about and a rank 2 tensor would be represented by this sort of two-dimensional objects with rows and columns, i representing the rows, k representing the columns. Before we continue though, I want to thank Brilliant for sponsoring this video. The best way to learn anything is by doing that thing yourself. And Brilliant's super fun, hands-on and interactive lessons in maths, science and computer science allow you to do just that. Crucially, Brilliant has lots of great courses for all ability levels, so you can start off where you feel comfortable and build from there. I am a firm believer that anyone and everyone can understand STEM subjects well with the help of good learning resources, and Brilliant offers just that with their clear and intuitive explanations of each topic. I personally have been really enjoying working through a course called Quantum Mechanics with Sabina. I'm a huge fan of Sabina Hossenfelder's YouTube channel, as I'm sure many of you are, and taking part in her quantum mechanics course has been a real treat. I'm also looking forward to improving my math skills by taking on courses such as group theory and multivariable calculus. Now, if you'd like to check out some of the brilliant courses that Brilliant has to offer, then please click the link in the description box or the one in the pinned comment. Using the link, you can get started for free, and the first 200 of you to click the link will get 20% off an annual membership. So please do check out the link. It helps out the channel, of course, and Brilliant is brilliant. Thank you so much to Brilliant once again for sponsoring this video. Now let's get back to Einstein's blackboard. So what about this eta? Why is Einstein writing g on one side of the equation and eta on the other? Well, the convention in general relativity is to use g to represent a general metric. But as Path said, we usually use eta to describe one special metric in particular. That special metric is the one that describes flat spacetime, a universe with no curvature at all. This flat spacetime is one where all of the usual rules of geometry that we know actually work. For example, angles in a triangle add up to 180 degrees and parallel lines never meet. You might think that those things are always true, but in curved space, they're actually not. My favorite way to see this is to compare a piece of paper with the surface of a sphere. These are admittedly two-dimensional examples because that's a lot easier for our human brains to understand than four-dimensional space-time. On the flat piece of paper, here representing a flat universe. 
If we draw a triangle and measure the interior angles, they will always add up to 180 degrees as we'd expect. And if we draw two parallel lines, no matter how long we draw them, they'll stay parallel forever and never meet. That's kind of the definition of parallel. But if we do the same things on the surface of a sphere, representing a curved universe, then a triangle like this will always have more than 180 degrees. And these two parallel lines meet at the North Pole. I think these differences between flat and curved surfaces are really cool. And in fact, I have a video all about them that includes way more details, which you can see right up here. Another important difference is that the shortest distance between two places in flat space is always the straight line between them. On a sphere, this isn't true though. To get from one place to another, you have to follow the curvature of the sphere. You can't tunnel through, that would take too much energy. We use an array called a matrix to represent the metrics that describe spacetime. While the matrices that represent G, a generic matrix, can include all sorts of complicated functions and expressions and be a bit confusing to look at. The matrix that describes the flat metric eta is incredibly simple. It's a zero in every slot except the diagonal entries. These are all one except the very first entry, which is minus one. That's a subtlety that lets us treat space and time two fundamentally different quantities with the same mathematical formalism, but it isn't really too important for this video. Hey, by the way, I've made a few videos discussing the metric tensor over on my channel before. Check one of them out up here if you're interested. I'll also leave a link in the description box below to a playlist that you might like. So as we can see, this general metric tensor G and the flat space-time metric tensor eta are used all over the place on this blackboard. What Einstein is doing here is trying to describe a generic space-time metric using the flat spacetime one and then adding these interesting entities called tetrads to incorporate the curvature in. So what exactly are these tetrads? Tetrads are basically a series of independent vectors that can be defined at every single point in any spacetime that we're studying. We can see them used here and here on the blackboard. Basically, if we're studying spacetime that looks like this, and we imagine that we as an observer are found here within the space-time, then we could define four vectors, three spatial ones and one time one that would represent our local coordinate system. They basically point in the direction in which each of these coordinates is increasing. As always, this is a simplified diagram, so we can only show a 2D surface rather than a 4D one, but the point still stands. For a surface curve like this, the direction in which each coordinate increases depends on what point in that space-time we're at. The tetrads just help us work out each of these directions and each of these points. Interestingly, the tetrads used on the board have two different kinds of index. These numbers show which component of the vector we're talking about, but these numbers just show us which tetrad we're talking about, whether it's the time one or one of the three spatial ones, with each one being given a specific index. In essence then, what Einstein seems to be doing here is rewriting general relativity in what is known as the tetrad formalism, meaning in terms of these vectors that can be defined at each point in space-time, rather than writing general relativity in terms of the curvature or metric tensor. This tetrad formalism is usually convenient for making real measurements within the space-time as it defines a useful set of vectors that people at these points can use, whereas the metric is more used as a general mathematical description of the space-time surface from a theoretical perspective. Additionally, tetrads can be written as vectors mathematically, while the metric tensor needs to be written as a matrix with more components in it than the tetrad. So on a surface level, pun intended, Tetrads are simpler to work with than the metric tensor. Our best guess for why Einstein was doing all of this is to compare these two different ways of writing general relativity. That's the metric one and the tetrad one. He did this by comparing the degrees of freedom in each theory. These degrees of freedom are basically the number of independent parameters in the problem or theory we're looking at. But let's explain that with an example. Let's say we have a tennis ball, like this and we want to describe how it's moving through the air. We could use usual x, y, z coordinates to do that. And we'd need all three of those coordinates to completely describe the ball's position at any one time. Since we need three numbers to describe the position, we say there are three degrees of freedom here. In fact, we could use any coordinate system we like. For example, spherical polets are theta phi. If you want to know more about polar coordinates, then I can definitely recommend this video here. Whichever coordinates we use, we'll always need three of them to describe the position of the ball in the air. 
That's because the ball has three independent directions it can move in. Forwards and backwards, side to side, and up and down. Changing the coordinates we use doesn't change the degrees of freedom of the problem. However, if we now think a ball that's just rolling around on the table, things are a bit different. Since the ball can only move on the tabletop, then we only need two coordinates to describe the position. We no longer need a height coordinate, and hence describing a ball on a tabletop is a problem that only has two degrees of freedom. The reason we bring all of this up is because Einstein may have been doing something like this on a much more complicated scale. Relativity, as written using metric tensors, has a certain number of degrees of freedom, and these degrees of freedom can essentially be packaged up in many different ways and in different places within the theory. But the number of degrees of freedom remains the same in each case, and we think that this is what Einstein was showing on this part of the blackboard. The total number of degrees of freedom in the old way of writing relativity, which is what he's calling it, using the metric tensor, and the new way of writing it using tetrads is the same. As we saw earlier, Einstein may have been trying to write relativity using tetrads because they seem like simpler mathematical entities. However, he's just shown that the degrees of freedom in each case are the same, just packaged up in different places, as Chris has mentioned in his video. Coming back to our example of a ball used to describe degrees of freedom, it's basically like writing the position and motion of the ball using x, y, z coordinates in one instance and spherical r, theta, phi coordinates in another instance. They're different ways of writing the theory, and one may be more convenient than the other in some cases, but the fundamental physics is still the same in that the number of degrees of freedom that we've got is still the same in each case. Three degrees of freedom. If you'd like to know more about exactly where these degrees of freedom can be found in Einstein's maths, let us know in the comments down below. We'd love to take a deep dive into it. Another thing worth mentioning is Einstein's very own summation convention and how he's kind of terrible at using it. Basically, quite often in relativity, we find that we need to multiply two objects term by term and specifically the terms with the same index as each other and then add up all of these quantities. A simple example of this is finding the dot product or scalar product between two vectors. If you're unfamiliar with this, the dot product tells us about how aligned two vectors are. And to find this dot product, we first multiply the first term of the first vector by the first term of the second vector. Then we add this to the product of the second terms of both vectors, and we continue doing this, multiplying the terms with the same index, and then adding it to the sum that we were creating. In the notation used within relativity, this would be shown like this. The same index, in one case upstairs and in the other case downstairs. This isn't super important, the upstairsiness and downstairsiness, but that's just how it's written in the maths of relativity. The point is that we take the terms with the same index from the two objects, multiply them together, and then add all of these terms up. Einstein realized that we could use a notation that gets rid of the summation sign. Every time we see an upstairs index and then the same downstairs index on the object multiplying it, or downstairs and then upstairs, again the same indices, we immediately know that this implies a sum over all of the terms. So we don't actually need to write the summation sign down, it doesn't actually need to be there, it's redundant. But on this blackboard he's been pretty relaxed about using this convention. He doesn't follow the summation convention, he writes eta with one index instead of two, until he writes it with two for no reason. Also, he randomly rubs out indices when he doesn't think they're relevant. Look just here. He clearly had a beta written in the subscript here, but in this line he's saying that we can just ignore the beta components, so he decides to just rub them out here. It doesn't make sense for it to have actually disappeared, so this must just be Einstein making a point. So, to sum up, Einstein was doing some clever complicated relativity stuff on the blackboard and he was a bit let's say, relaxed with the notation while he was doing it. This could have been because he was just rough working on a problem, or maybe he was demonstrating this stuff to someone else and he was rubbing stuff out that wasn't important as he was going along the way. Maybe you have some thoughts on exactly what he was doing here. Was he really referring to a killing vector field here, or was he just feeling a bit murderous? Let us know your thoughts in the comments down below. And if you'd like a more detailed deep dive into the mathematics, please do let us know as well. I'd like to say a huge thanks to Chris for approaching me about deciphering Einstein's blackboard. It's been an absolute blast. Please check out his channel. He makes some really amazing videos, including the one that goes along with this one that you've just finished watching. And because he's a proper physicist with a PhD and research under his belt, he's got a wonderful perspective on physics and how we can understand it better. Seriously, go check out his channel.
And of course, thank you for watching. If you liked this video, then please hit the thumbs up button, subscribe and hit that bell button for more fun physics content. Check out my merch, linked in the description box below. It features a famous quote from Einstein about quantum physics. Or more specifically, it features my interpretation of that quote. And finally, a huge thanks to all of my Giga patrons and all of the others over on my Patreon page. That's linked in the description box below as well if you'd like to support me on there. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you very soon. Thank you.